<laughs> oh, wait, I guess I'll just have to give my talk instead. So, uh, if you didn't know it, or if you did know it, you know that I have been in, I was in California for the past couple of weeks. Uh, I was, uh, it was partly for business, it was mostly for pleasure. I went there, honest to goodness, it was partly business. I went and did some service work for our parent organization, but then I met my family in Lake Tahoe for a family reunion. I know life is tough, right? When the kids were younger, and I don't have children myself, but I have nieces and a nephew, uh, when they were younger, we would go to Lake Tahoe just about like every other year as a family. We would rent a few houses and, and and we would uh, have that time together as a family. And the last time that we went was in 2000, up until this past uh, week, uh, was in 2002 when my parents were still alive. And so you can imagine for us of my generation now how thrilling it was when the kids decided that they wanted to start that tradition again with their own kids. And that's the reason why we all came together. There was one major difference, however, and that is that instead of our parents being the elders, <laughs> my siblings and I were the elders. And I don't really know what I think about that. In fact, here's one of my favorite memories. Now, we got three different houses because at, I think at our peak point, we had about 18 people there. So we had three different houses so everybody could be comfortable. And, and we got there first, and we were walking up to my, the house that my brother had, had rented, and I had a bottle of the world's greatest salad dressing. If you haven't ever tried it, it's called Little Creek Salad Dressing. It comes from Kelowna. That's just a little commercial. But anyway, so I've got a, a bottle of this, the world's greatest salad dressing that I'm going to bring to my brother because he hasn't tasted it. And we saw him, and he's heading down the street with a bag of freshly baked bread and just then the other elders from the other family show up and they've got all kinds of delicious goodies and it kind of felt like a powwow you know here the elders show up and we show up first and we give each other food in this kind of gratitude and love and welcoming it was actually really really cool now what I promise you I do promise that this is not going to be just a travel log of how I spent my summer vacation. I could do that if you'd like, but I actually, what, what, you guys out there? Okay, just want to make sure. I did have a couple of insights and a couple of aha moments while I was there. There's something for me, maybe it's for you, but there's something for me that when I get surrounded by nature, and I don't have a lot of responsibility because I'm the youngest of the family and they don't listen to me anyway. But you know, I'm there and I'm surrounded by the trees and the lake and everything and it just gets my juices flowing, you know? And, and, and it, it just, it's a wonderful opportunity to be in a creative sense. But before I tell you about what those insights were, I want to talk a little bit about my talk title. Now you might notice that perhaps it's a tiny play on words because the U.S., and you all know I'm from the U.S., right, just celebrated uh, the 4th of July, otherwise known as Independence Day. Well, what I've discovered, so I call my talk Interdependence, because what I discovered is that the words independence and interdependence, although they kind of sound pretty much the same, actually mean very different things. For instance, here are some of the synonyms for independence. Freedom, liberty, self-autonomy, self-rule, self-determination. Cool, right? Raise your hand if you would like to experience these things. Okay, only about half of you. The rest of you just are not that into it. Okay, you know, sounds pretty good. We want to think that we are free. We want to think that we are liberty to make our own decisions, right? I mean, but when we really talk about independence, what we are talking about is things on the outside, our outside circumstances and our outside situations. For instance, when we are independent, we are free to live where we want to live, to worship what or who or as we want, to eat what we want, to love whom we want. So independence is a beautiful thing. And we can be grateful for it because we have those 
those liberties living here in North America. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Can I get a yeehaw? Yeehaw! <laughs> really? <laughs> when we're talking, though, about inner dependence, it goes much deeper. It goes to that part of us that resides inside of us. It is that spark of divinity that is within each of us. And that spark of divinity has never known lack. It has never known limitation. It's never known anything other than wisdom and possibility and prosperity and all those things. Now, we may call that inner self different things. Some people call it God. Some people call it uh, the Christ consciousness. Some people call it infinite wisdom or, or, or the divine. But, but each of us has it. Each of us has it. Put your hand right. This is where it feels like for me. Some people it's here. Some people it's here. But for me it's right here. That's the inner. That's the inner dependence. And each of us has it. And each of us is able to use it consciously. By consciously, I mean on purpose. When we know it's there, when we know that we are one with God, when we know that that is within us, we can use it consciously to develop the lives that we want. Yay, huh? Did something like that? Am I good? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we are being interdependent, we are relying not only on our innate abilities and talents, but we are also relying on something that is expressing and knowing itself through us and as us. Here's how Ernest Holmes put it. People with spiritual self-reliance have a deep conviction that they are attuned to an infinite intelligence and that they are one with the all-knowing spirit. First of all, there must be an awareness of the presence of God. Next, and equally necessary, is faith in the spiritual self. The faith to which we are referring is not a faith in an isolated self which struggles through life alone, but faith in an inner knowledge. Put your hand right here again and feel it. We are in partnership with the all-knowing spirit. It is who we are. It is what we are. And that means that we can depend on it. <coughs> the challenge for many of us, and I'm going to include myself in that statement. The challenge is that sometimes when it comes to everyday living or everyday challenges, we forget what we know. We forget this, right? We almost think that if we call upon the divine wisdom and intelligence within us for mundane life stuff, that we're going to use it all up. Anybody else? <laughs> we tell ourselves that we should only rely, we should only ask for something if it's really, really, really important. Or if it's for someone else. Right? And we think that we should be able to do it ourselves independently when the reality is we are in partnership with it and so we can rely on it and we can, re we can, we can depend on it innerly. I'm not sure that's a word. <laughs> because the truth is there is no lack. There is no limitation in the universe. It isn't up there counting favors asked and prayers prayed. The universe, God, the divine, whatever you call it, is the divine givingness. And it is expressing life through us and as us all of the time. So how come we're afraid to use it in our lives at any time that we want or need? Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Can I get a yee to 
that? Give me a finger on his toes. We need to stop denying the nature of the universe. It is good, harmonious. It is for us, not against us. If we have arrived at the point where we have complete confidence in its perfect action, in its ability to create, maintain, and sustain life within us today, to supply us with all our needs, then that is what it will do for us tomorrow, and tomorrow, and on into the future. It is here for us, and it wants to expressed through us. It wants to participate in life with us as us. So it is incumbent upon us to, as a famous book says, give God a good time. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know this book I wrote. <laughs> That was a little joke, a very little joke. Okay, so you may be wondering what this has to do with my vacation and the insights that I gained. Well, now I'm going to tell you. I mentioned uh, to you that the last time my family got together in, 2000, uh, in Lake Tahoe for a reunion prior to this last one was in 2002, so that was 12 years ago. And a lot has changed for me since 2002. Several of the changes have to do with relying on my interdependence. And it has nothing to do with moving to Canada. And the first one, what I'm going to share with you, is a little uncomfortable. So just know that I'm feeling a little vulnerable right now when I share this with you. But I think it's important, and it was the insight that I received when I was on this trip. In 2002, I was well over 100 pounds heavier than I am right now. In fact, I saw pictures of myself on that vacation, and it was pretty eye-opening for me. Now, the funny thing was, even as heavy as I was, I was relatively happy. I was a successful minister in California. I owned a house, I had lots of friends, I had my family, I did lots of fun stuff, but physically, I was very unfit. And Lake Tahoe can be a drag. <laughs> if you are not fit. First of all, it's the thin air, right? The, you know, because it's a pretty high altitude. And then, you know, so much about the lake has to do with physical stuff. I mean, hiking and water activities, or if you're there in the winter skiing, which I never was, but you, you understand. And, and so, even though I was already a minister, and I was already teaching this, and I was already uh, having success as a result of this teaching, I didn't yet believe that I could be interdependent for something that I considered to be my fault, like my weight. Is this making sense to you? Yeah. I didn't think that I could bother the divine with something that I was creating, that I was causing. I felt as if I had to rely on my own willpower to make the change rather than relying on something that was greater than me. And you know, Ernest Holmes has a lot to say about willpower because, you know, willpower is that, this, right? And you can't keep that up for long, right? It's much better to allow things, to have that inner dependence that we're talking about. But back then, in 2002, my spiritual practice did not include any sort of work around witness, uh, uh, fitness or weight. It wasn't until several years ago that I actually gave myself permission to apply what I knew to something like that. It, 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 I, I didn't allow myself to go to God for assistance in releasing the extra weight. Now, granted, obviously, I am not still, I am not real thin, but you know what? I am a heck of a lot fitter than I was in 2002. And this year, I was able to hike. I was able to kayak. This is actually me. I, I took that picture. Honest to goodness. See how blue the lake is? It really, really is it. I was able to do all kinds of activities that I never ever dream that I would be able to do. 
Marcus Aurelius said, look well into thyself. There is a source of strength which will always spring up if thou wilt always look. But you got to know it's there, and you got to be willing to look for it and to use it. Because it is yearning to be used. It is yearning to be expressed because that is its nature. Here we go like this. So I have another story that uh, stems from this 2002 trip as well uh, in comparing it with the one that I just took. And uh, it also has to do with interdependence. Uh, I'm just telling you guys everything. Here. Okay. So, uh, sometime in my 30s, uh, which was a few years, yeah, just a few years ago, I developed an overwhelming soul-sucking, unexplainable, and irrational fear of being in a car on a mountain road. Now, you know the kind of roads I'm talking about, right? The switchbacks and the sheer drop-offs. Yeah, well, you guys are mountain folk. I mean, you know what? But anyway, the, the only way I could do it for years and years and years, I swear to God, ladies and gentlemen, if I did it at all, which wasn't very often, I would have to lie in the back seat with my eyes closed, moaning. The moaning was part of it. Because, because I was terrified that somehow the driver was going to go suddenly insane and drive off the side of the mountain. Absolutely convinced. Now this is a bummer, you have to understand, because I love being in the mountains. I just hated getting there. I would become absolutely terrorized, terrorized, paralyzed. And this went on for years, including all of those times that we went to Lake Tahoe. It was highly inconvenient. <laughs> now, if you've been to the lake, you know this, but one of the most beautiful drives, because it's a very, very beautiful place, one of the beautiful drives is along, it, it, it's like one of those incredibly narrow two-lane roads, you know, with one going this way and one going that way, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Switch back. <laughs> really narrow. On one side was sheer drop-offs is Emerald Bay. On the other side, with sheer drop-offs, is a lake called Fallen Leaf Lake. And it's this incredibly narrow road. And invariably coming towards us is a motorhome. <laughs> the few times that I allowed myself to be on the road, which wasn't very often, I thought that I was going to lose my mind, or my lunch, or both. It represented the epitome of my fear of Mount Rose. And this went on for a lot of years. Ask anybody who knew me back then. However, again, Using this teaching, I decided that I had to let go of this because the fact of the matter is I love the mountains. I love being in the mountains. So once again, I used spiritual practice. I went within and I started doing my spiritual work around the situation. It went something like this. I know that God is all there is. Therefore, I know that God is in the roads, and it's in the engineers who designed the roads, and it's in the workers who built the roads, and it's the makers of the asphalt that the roads were made of, and it's in the other drivers on the roads who are not going to go insane and plummet me off the road, and it's in the builders of the cars that are driving on the roads. You understand? I had to get down to that nth degree of understanding that God is all there is, and that means that God is within everything and everyone and every situation on those roads. I had to tap into inner courage. 
and I had to remind myself, I could do a whole talk on this one, that fear is simply the misuse of faith. And because I have faith in the divine within me, then I had to know and came to know that I could also have faith in my safety and the safety of others who were on those roads. So the long story short, and if you want to read the whole story, it's a chapter in my book called Giving God a Good Time. You can get it on Amazon because we don't have any here. But <laughs> I was actually able to heal that mountain road phobia. Honest to goodness. I was able to heal it. And I was able to do it. What I can do now is that I can not only be a passenger on a car on a mountain road, but I can actually drive on mountain roads with controlled caution versus abject fear. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a healing. And the reason, thank you, thank you. The reason I'm sharing it with you on my talk on interdependence is because in order to get to one of those hikes that I could do now that I'm fitter and healthier, I have to be on that super scary road on Emerald Bay with on one side and fallen leaf on the other side. I could no more have done that in 2002. Not only could I not have done the hike, but I couldn't have been on the road as, as I would do anything that sounds impossible. But because I've chosen to do my work and, and rely on my inner dependence, my reliance on God, I was able to do it in 2014. And I have pictures. That's on the way down to Emerald Bay. I took that picture with my iPhone. And there I am with some of the members of the family on my way down. So I would like to close with another Ernest Holmes quote about self-reliance, which is just another term for inner dependence. He says, developing confidence in ourselves and our ability to meet and handle all undesirable situations requires that we must have confidence in that something which is greater than we are. Then we will have spiritual self-reliance. When this is done, the lesser must always submit to the greater. Sit with that for a minute. The lesser must always submit to the greater. Weakness will give way to strength. Despair will turn to hope. Hate will become love. Failure will become success. And sickness will dissolve into health. The action that takes place is not one of despotic or overruling harshness, but one that moves in harmony, love, beauty, warmth, and order, quietly transforming all that is unlike it. Uh, Michelle, would you come up and do a little noodle for me? I'm going to just have us take us through a little bit of an exercise here. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes if you would, just for a moment. And knowing that you are absolutely safe here, I invite you to think about something right now that feels a little scary or overwhelming. 